Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome. And thanks for traveling to be uh, here with us today. Um, it was looking a little dodgy a couple of weeks ago with the train strike, but we are all here. And your support and attendance is hugely appreciated by me, by the sponsors and our exhibitors. And also a particularly warm welcome to those who are joining us remotely. So as Mark said, this will be my last summit speech um, as MPCC chair. Um, in April next year, uh, my four-year term will come to an end. And I'm delighted to be handing over to Gavin Stevens, uh, Chief Constable of Surrey Police. And I know Gavin will provide excellent leadership for MPCC in the really important role that it will continue to play. And I've no doubt that the coming years will be no less lively than the ones that I've um, lived through. The theme of the summit this year is cutting crime and building confidence. But before I get on to that, I just want to reflect on the past year and also on my time in, in this role. So as the chair, I have felt immense pride in my profession on many occasions. I'm incredibly proud at how the service rose to the challenge of COVID. We police the regularly changing regulations, often different across the four nations, with one policing approach, and we maintain public confidence throughout. Last, the last year has seen some of the largest gatherings and ceremonial occasions in our lifetimes, encompassing times of collective celebration and mourning. And these have all been matched by effective and professional policing operations, on quite an incredible scale, drawing on the capability of every force in the UK. From Police Scotland's operation to support COP26 climate conference in Glasgow a year ago to the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham this summer. And 2022 will also be remembered as the year that we sadly lost our longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, triggering a well-rehearsed and meticulously planned 10-day operation. The policing of the period of national mourning, the accession of King Charles III and the state funeral was the largest ever ceremonial operation that we've done. More than 5,000 officers from across the UK ensured security so that the public could pay their respects safely at events across all four nations. And those officers came from 47 police services as well as British overseas territories including Gibraltar, the Falkland Islands and Bermuda. Elsewhere, officers continue to demonstrate professionalism, tenacity and resilience when responding to increasingly challenging protest activity. This week, we're seeing protests on the road network, but a combination of proactivity and preparedness has meant that we've been able to reopen the busy motorways quickly. And working with government and other agencies, we continue to use civil injunctions as well as our crim criminal powers to minimise disruption. And I'm sure some of you this morning are seeing on the media, this morning we've had an Essex police motorcyclist who's been injured responding to one of the demonstrations on the motorway there. Thankfully not seriously, but I think it really brings home the point of the damage that can be caused. Policing is not anti-protest, but we are pro-responsibility and for having due regard to the rights of others. And we will continue to take all appropriate action against anyone who deliberately chooses to protest outside of the law. I'm also proud of the collective commitment made by police chiefs to deliver transformative change in how we tackle violence against women and girls and in our relationship with black people. Two critical issues in retaining the trust and confidence of all communities. Chiefs across England and Wales have committed to a programme of change through the Police Race Action Plan to achieve an anti-racist police service. And over 5,000 organisations and individuals have provided feedback on the first iteration of the plan, which will shape its future development and delivery. And every force in England and Wales has its own local action plan aligned to the MPCC and College of Policing VORG framework. Op Soteria Bluestone is now active in 19 police forces. And as a result, independent sexual violence advisors in some of the forces are saying for the first time in a long time, they can truly recommend that rape victims should speak to the police. But I've also experienced some of the darkest moments as a police officer. I've repeatedly felt shame at hearing the actions of some individuals in our service and deeply regret that we didn't get these people out sooner. Last week, I responded to HMIC FRS's inspection on vetting, counter-corruption and misconduct 
on behalf of chiefs. And whilst the inspectorate agreed the vast majority of vetting decisions and found the majority of misconduct investigations were effective, that still leaves a deeply concerning number of decisions that were just plain wrong and dangerously wrong, allowing predators or wholly unsuitable individuals to join or stay in policing and to do harm to their colleagues or the public. That simply is not good enough. The report listed previous inspections, strategies and action plans shared over the past decade that warned of problems and gave specific recommendations for change. And I know better than most that after each of those interventions, police forces took action. I know there have been many improvements and effective new initiatives over the past decade, but it has been made abundantly clear that it hasn't been enough. It hasn't been comprehensive and consistent enough. It hasn't ensured the highest standards in our vetting and misconduct, and it hasn't eliminated pockets of toxic culture. The surveys and interviews conducted by the inspectorate show too many women in policing have experienced predatory and misogynistic behavior and that they've been let down by the response. And a recent survey of black officers and staff, which is due to be published in December, has shown incidents of racial microaggressions, discrimination and harassment are common and prevalent. And we also know that other minoritized groups, LGBTQ+, disabled people and other ethnic minorities inside and outside policing have real concerns. And I want to speak directly to all of those who've had the courage to raise those concerns. Thank you for speaking out. You are doing the right thing. You are contributing to the change that you want to see, so keep doing it. And I'm sorry that you've experienced behavior that you shouldn't have faced and that you've been let down by the response. And I'm sorry that the weight of the worry, or the weight of the worry that that's caused but now a message to all the police leaders in this room. Individually and collectively, locally and nationally, we must now take that burden from those who've carried it for that time. We must solve the problems urgently, fully, and for the long term. No piecemeal change or half measures. Public confidence and the confidence of our people depends upon it. And I commit to doing everything in my power alongside all of our MPCC leads in this area, the College of Policing, the Home Office, the IOPC, to support the changes that we must make. So, cutting crime and building confidence are ambitions shared by all of us in this summit, including the Home Secretary and the Police Minister. More importantly, it's what the public expects and deserves. And a few reflections on how we can make that ambition a reality. We've made considerable gains in reducing and preventing crime. The number of burglaries is down 51% in the last decade due to prevention and investigation work. The latest ONS figures show falls in robbery, vehicle offences and crimes involving knives and firearms. But we're solving 50% less crime than seven years ago. Our capabilities to tackle the 4.5 million frauds a year are still too limited and the public are noticing and confidence is on a downward trend. We want to focus on volume crime like burglary and the most harmful violent crimes like domestic abuse, rape, knife crime and murder. We want to invest more heavily in neighborhood policing to tackle crimes and local problems and also to bring, build connectedness and legitimacy with all the communities so that we can truly police in partnership. And we must also continue our fight against the enduring and ever-changing threats from organized crime, terrorism, cyber-enabled criminality by working with partners at an international, regional, national, regional and local level to prevent those harms. But we are held back from focusing on these core responsibilities and we need the government's help to change that. Firstly, the vast widening of the policing mission needs to be taken on. There are various figures and estimates that I could use, but I don't think there's any doubt that over half of all calls to serve for service that we receive are for something other than crime. Now, some of that is entirely legitimate police activity, but a substantial proportion see police stepping in to health and social care work because of an absence of other service provision. This issue has been raised at every one of these summits, 
and I and many others have discussed it with every recent Home Secretary and Policing Minister. But there has been no meaningful change, and that needs to happen if we are to improve crime reduction and detection rates. I know the government want us to get the basics right, so I'm hopeful and optimistic that they will want to support us in finding solutions to this issue. Secondly, I reiterate our calls for the Home Office to review the crime recording standards. Currently, the process presents a misleading picture to the public about the levels of crime because there are many incidents recorded as crimes that will never be solved or prosecuted, and in some of those are not even crimes in reality. Police recorded crime tells the public that crime's at an all-time high, but the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which measures people's actual experience, shows crime is falling and is much lower than 20 years ago. There must be a better way to give the public both accuracy and transparency. Last year, our lead on crime reporting estimated that close to 1,200 officers and staff are involved in ensuring compliance with crime recording in England and Wales at a cost of around £47 million annually. If we can reduce the bureaucracy currently involved in the process and could free up just half of those staff as a result, that could mean something like an additional 300 new neighbourhood police officers. That's about seven for every force in England and Wales. And my final point there is, is around the criminal justice system, which desperately needs reform. The Director of Public Prosecutions just last week said that the backlog of defendants awaiting Crown Court trial has reached nearly 75,000. This is not a new issue. Many of the problems existed long before the pandemic had its inevitable impact on the efficiency of the system. We need a robust model that works from end to end. And that was a manifesto commitment in 2019 to hold a royal commission into, criminal, into the criminal justice system. Now, that model, I accept, has its downsides, but I continue to support and ask for the need for a comprehensive, independent review. Addressing those three key issues will mean that police chiefs can direct more resources to solving crime and meeting the public's priorities, and justice will be delivered more quickly and effectively. Strengthening police culture so that it's more inclusive, better at listening and involving the public in its decisions, and has the highest professional and ethical standards is as important as crime fighting. If there is any doubt about that, reading Baroness Louise Casey's interim report into misconduct in the Met and HMIC FRS's report from last week should dispel it. We must act in this area. Where we struggle to explain that action that we're taking or, or we don't think it's having a positive impact, then we should reconsider it. But if we get accused of being woke when we take action that we know is effective in building trust and building that trust with, with people where that increased trust is needed, we must stand tall, we must champion it and we must defend that action. We're all rightly sceptical of tokens or gimmicks where practical people and meaningful action and what, that works is what we need. My time chair in the MPCC has seen the first significant financial investment in policing since 2012 with the recruitment of the additional 20,000 police officers through the Uplift programme. That government investment has allowed us to put more officers into response and neighbourhood teams and to bring in new direct entry detectives. The seeds, however, of many of our current performance challenges were sown in those years of austerity. And despite the very welcome recent investment, officer and staff numbers remain lower than a decade ago. We all know that the country is facing serious economic challenges and the government has extremely difficult decisions to make about public spending. And it's sobering to reflect that even without any other changes, the estimated additional cost pressures for police's, police forces in 23-24 amounts to a third of a billion pounds. If the uplift in police officers is not maintained, the benefits of the growth since 2019 will be lost. More pressure on other public services means more pressure on the core policing mission. We all know that underfunded public services are not reforming public services, 
and good performance is built on certain and sustainable funding. I urge the government to, take, to factor this into their decisions. A cash-starved police service and criminal justice system will struggle to make necessary changes and improve public and victim satisfaction. Many of those issues that I've discussed or I've spoken about are the ones that we will discuss in a lot more detail over the coming two days from a range of perspectives. I think it gives us a really important opportunity to get underneath the skin of these things and how we're all going to collectively take them forward in the years ahead. So let's get on to those important discussions now. Thank you for listening.